Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week on Common Ground, meet Tom Halverson of Laporte, who draws portraits of children with fantasy-like features. Laura Pacer of Niswa shows us the art of glass fusing. And Candace Fitzloff Westfield of Walker creates jewelry with precious metals with a naturalistic impression. My name is Tom Halverson, and I'm a, what I call a fantasy portrait artist. Um, normally, I just start with her chin when I draw someone's face, and it's sort of like a like a structure, you know, start with a foundation and build my way up. And I usually spend most time on the eyes because that's where we recognize a person, is through their eyes. As I go along and transfer from the graphite pencil to the color pencils, I'll perfect the likeness. And then when I shade it in with some color, powdered chalk, I'll get it even a little closer that way. So then I'm going to switch over to my pose and look at the pose and actually draw her a body. And then I give them some wings. I've got several different wing designs I've developed over the years, but the butterfly for a fairy is usually the basic concept I aim at for uh, most of the sketches I do of fairies. Now I'm ready to actually start coloring this picture in. I've got all these different colors I'm going to work with, and some of them, they get dull pretty fast, so I've got a lot of pencils uh, pre-sharpened, ready to use, and I'll switch out for some sharp ones between each sketch. In a sketch, I spend most of the time on the face capturing the likeness. Uh, drawing the body and the wings and all that is like really fast compared. The hardest part of doing a portrait is making it actually look like their face. I want these sketches to be really colorful so when they hang it in their bedroom it's going to cheer them up just to look at it, you know. I think these sketches, you know, when a, a child gets wings or something like that in a fantasy sketch, it boosts their self-esteem. Even though it's a fantasy, you know, their subconscious mind, they say, does not know the difference between fantasy and reality, so <laughs> I think it does them a little bit of good. Now I'm going to try to get the outline of her face. It's just this dark around the edges of her face. Oh, there I've got the shape and I'll bring some of her hair down. I'm going to use some dark in her hair. And so now I've pretty well got her all outlined. So what I want to do at this point is study her backwards in the mirror. And I'll just take it and turn around and study her face in the mirror here. When I use the mirror, it actually eliminates all the imaginary things I thought I had drawn. And uh, I see the sketch as, as if from new eyes, you know, because everything in the mirror is backwards. And I'm going to use another kind of a rag. It's kind of a stretchy one. And I'm going to use this to dip my finger in the chalk. I pick a spot where the color has been used, that same color. And here's just a regular film canister and pastel chalk that I've crushed into a fine powder. But I like the stretchy rag because it um, allows me to feel the paper really well so I know where my finger is drawing. And the nice thing about the finger is it's being round. You can change the size of the line you're creating just by the pressure you're putting on the paper. So then I can get in like with the flowers, get in little tight petals and stuff just by backing off with my finger a little bit and then I'll pick some skin tone. I'll actually use several different colors in the skin. Mostly this color which is kind of a peach or a tan and I'm going to 
leave a little highlighter on the edges to give shape to her arms and shoulders. So I'm gonna put some of that black in here now. Black is a real potent color. I'm gonna use up the, the, the most potent part of it on my finger in the dark shadows here. Now I'll do her pink dress. Well, I got pink here, but I'm gonna use a little, a little dark pink. This is my little electric eraser. I'm just gonna get some little highlights. It makes it stand out. And I wanna mix some of the sparkles with some a uh, little shine to them. So I'm just making my eraser like a wedge shape. So now, there you have it. That's a little fairy princess. And I guess there's always one last thing to do and that's to sign it. So yeah, there we go. What I like about what I do probably most of all is the, just the joy I give to the kids. I mean, they really enjoy it. They, they uh, light up when they see the portrait at the end, you know, and they, because I actually draw it while they shop around. They come and I take a photo of them, then they go and come back and see the finished results. I hold up the sketch and they just, you know, the light comes on and they recognize themselves. But then it's not just them, but they've got fairy wings or dragon wings or a mermaid tail. And it's all of a sudden they are like what they saw on TV that they favorite movies they're watching all the time. It's just, fun actually giving joy to other people all the time. My favorite piece of art that I've made is probably a uh, an oil painting that I did. It's uh, about three feet by four feet of a little girl uh, I, I met in the Duluth Mall several years ago and I was actually doing her sketch and I was captivated by her eyes and when I was drawing them and I asked her mother if I could, uh, or it might have been her grandmother, if I could if I could actually paint her. So I took pictures of her right there in the mall and I painted her with this little deer. I found a deer uh, in a magazine and, uh, and she had a little tear coming down her face and the deer was there like comforting her. You know. And I still have this painting, you know, it's, uh, we don't have room in our little mobile home here, but it's, uh, it's rolled up and tucked in the rafters there somewhere. And uh, but it was just one of those that uh, yeah, had a, a lot of empathy to it, a pathos, I call it. My name is Laura Pacer and uh, I'm a glass artist. Um, I have uh, been involved with glasswork uh, for about nine years and I think I've always had a passion for glass that originated really with my, my childhood. My grandmother collected Polish and Czechoslovakian crystal and you know that sparkly stuff. And we had a lot of it in the house, in, in my grandmother's house anyway. And I really fell in love with glass at that time. And it was really coincidental that I started in stained glass. I um, used to live in the Twin Cities and I took a class at a store that was nearby and kind of fell in love with it. And the rest is history, as they say. And uh, I remember that year I made everyone <laughs> Christmas gifts um, out of stained glass. And uh, since then, I've uh, moved into mosaic work as well, as well, as, and then fused glass. Fused glass is most recent addition, but probably my my biggest passion because it's uh, it's very flexible. I think um, uh, you don't have to know how to draw. Uh, you have I have a good eye for color, and uh, so it's really um, a, a fun. Well, they're all fun, but um, I love doing fused glass because it enables me to. Uh, complete a project, let's say, much more quickly than doing a, a large commission work out of stained glass. I'm going to be making uh, actually a, a sushi dish, and this is an example of the completed project. And what makes um, this sushi dish uh, very distinctive is uh, the design elements that are added here. These are created uh, by me, um, and we'll be making the the design bar out of a variety of different glass products. Um, when a person fuses glass, uh, the glass has to be compatible, meaning that it moves at the same rate. All the glass has to be rated to move at the same uh, coefficient of expansion. And uh, so all the glass products that I have here in front of me 
are all rated at 96 COE, uh, and um, there are other COEs, um, 90 and 30 and 104, um, uh, but I, I primarily use um, System 96 glass. Really what I did first as my primary step was I chose my my palette of colors to work with and I happen to really like combining blues and greens so I have uh, a few different shades of, of greens and blues and I'll be uh, combining those to, to make a real lovely um, a lovely blend as everything is put together. Since I'm making the design bar to create this uh, this design, I need to know the width of it. And I already measured, of course, and it's five and a half inches wide. So I'm starting with a base of five and a half inches by seven inches just because I want to have enough to cut apart over time. There's no real rhyme or reason uh, to how I'm laying it out other than the fact I want it to be, be um, attractive visually to me. I'm stacking glass and there are openings so there's lots of there's a void in there so when the when the kiln is running uh, and the glass is melting because there's an opening this glass will sag and so if you look at some of the curves in the design that's where there were voids and there was nothing there and so the glass sagged into it. And using a design bar such as this really creates unique work because even if someone else makes a, a design bar using very similar colors, it's not ever going to be identical. It will never be identical. The thickness of the design bar is going to yield, excuse me, yeah, the, the height or the thickness of it is going to yield a different width. So height is width. You have to contain it when you're firing it um, because if this were left undammed, um, it would spread over, not over the whole, whole surface of the kiln shelf, but it would spread beyond, beyond these boundaries. So what we're going to do when we put it in the in the kiln is put a damming system around it to, to contain it and hold it in place. You can um, operate the kiln up to even 17 or 1800 degrees. For a regular fuse temperature it's 1465. When I put it into the kiln it was beyond the top of those those rigid dam bars. I used a glass saw to cut out the strips that became those design elements. I know already that the size of this finished piece is five and a half inches wide by ten and a half inches long and I'm going to cut apart some glass so that I have this piece, this piece, and this piece. These end pieces are each two and a half inches and this is five and a half inches long. So I, I'm using this veil, very pale green glass and I'm putting on um, a confetti glass on top of it. I buy all of my supplies from a distributor in Illinois and I usually go there in person once a year and I like to hand pick my glass. The glass that you see behind me is all used in stained glass. This is my private supply, kind of my personal wine cellar. And uh, in the store, um, that's all glass that is for sale. We have thousands of, of uh, square feet of sheet glass, both regular glass and fusible glass. It is really fun to go and, and pick it out. Oh my gosh, it's a huge, huge warehouse. Okay, so those are the basic pieces of the of the plate, and I will put it together the way that I did the the bar with glue. So roughly two layers of glass is the same thickness that I cut these pieces to, and you can feel that it's 
pretty darn equal. So I'll let that sit until it, um, it dries. So this is the unfired plate, the sushi plate. This is the next step. So this is what the sushi plate looks like once it is fired. And then once that would be done, the dish would be placed on the mold in the kiln just that way and it would be fired to slump it. And then this is the result. Hello, I'm Candace Westfield, and today I'm gonna show you how to work with a product called PMC. It's uh, precious metal clay. And I'm gonna incorporate a beach stone in this piece I'm making, because a lot of my work involves beach stones. So um, precious metal clay um, was invented by Mitsubishi Corporation um, about 12 years ago and it was made for jewelers as a way to create texture and three-dimensional things without having to cast, which is a much more labor-intensive process. This is what it looks like. It comes in a lump form and it's, you need to put a little bit of lubricant on your hands so it doesn't stick to your fingers. Tear off a piece. Condition it a little bit. You gotta think about that it's gonna shrink a little bit. When I decide on the size, I have to think about it, make it a little bigger than I want the end product to be to compensate for that shrinkage. And then I have these texture plates that I've made. Um, these are made from a two-part compound that you mix together and then you can press things into it to get a texture. And I've made my own textures out of plants that I've collected which is kind of my thing. Most of my work has some natural element to it. And then I will put it into one of the textures. I kind of like um, working with the clay like this because after it's fired, my fingerprints are actually in the back of it, which I kind of feel like is the ultimate mark of the artist. <laughs> it's about the size I want it to be. Now I gotta be thinking about that it's gonna shrink a little bit. And then I'm gonna put the other texture on there and just smush them together to get the texture on both sides of the piece and try not to move around too much. Yeah, that's pretty good. So now I'm gonna cut out the center of that. I'm gonna do it while it's on this texture plate so I don't wreck the texture in the back. Okay, so then I've got, now I've got this piece that's got a texture on both sides. Then I need to add one more thing to this and then we'll let it dry. Okay, I'm gonna put a hole in it right here to, to wrap the wire through. Okay, then the next step is to get this to dry, which I put it on this little drying tray. And that'll only take about five minutes. In the meantime, I'm gonna make a pair of earrings to match that. It's a little trickier because I have to have two pieces that are approximately the same size and shape. And these I'm only gonna texture on one side because you don't flip your earrings around anyway. I worked for the Forest Service for almost 20 years. That was my first career. And then in 1999, I quit. <laughs> Little holes out of these. Went back to school and in 2002 I started doing jewelry full-time after getting an art degree. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in school. I just wanted to do art and then I took a jewelry class and fell in love with it. And then I'm just gonna use this pin tool to put a couple holes in these. And then I will stick those on the dryer. Okay, to sand the clay, all you need is your basic emery file, which is really cool. And I'm just gonna go around and take all the little rough edges off and make it smooth. And the more finishing I can do at this stage, when it's really easy, the better. Get that till I like the feel of it, and then 
And all this dust that I'm creating, I will scrape up and save because it all, it's all silver in there. Okay, then that piece is ready to go in the kiln, get fired for two hours. That's just the way you get the strongest product in the end and all the binder burns off and you end up with fine silver. So this is a little kiln I use um, when I'm just doing a couple pieces, but if I was just doing a whole big batch, I'd use a, a bigger kiln that I have out in the garage. Okay, so when it comes out of the kiln, it's got this kind of a whitish cast to it. Um, it's because it has all these little microscopic bumps. And so the next step is to burnish it and get it, smooth those out. Um, and that'll look like shiny metal. So to burnish this, you just use um, a brass brush and a little water, and then I get a little soap on there. In fact, as a lubricant, and then you just, I guess the natural world is probably my biggest influence in my work. Textures of nature, and I use a lot of leaves and feathers and rocks. I just find those elements are more beautiful than diamonds and <laughs> fancy stones, so. Now it's ready to assemble. I just think that what nature has done to it is fascinating, you know, to pick up a smooth stone that looks almost polished and it's just been tumbled around in the lake, you know, that, um, or it has an interesting little spot in it or a line, or I just think it's beautiful and interesting and more of a treasure than a diamond. Next thing I need to do is I'm going to put a stone hanging in the middle of this piece, so I need to pick one that fits. I want one that's not too big and not too little, so I think I like that black one. So I need to drill a little hole in that stone so I can run a wire through it. Okay, to drill the stone, you need to have it in water so it and the bit don't get too hot. I pick up stones everywhere I go. Actually, I did that before I started using the jewelry, so it was kind of a natural progression to start to do something with all of them. I make textures out of leaves and grass and things in nature, my texture plates that I use for clay. I'm always paying attention to textures in nature and trying to replicate those in my work. Okay, there's a hole in there. All right, so now I have all the parts that I need to put this together and make it into a necklace. I think it's the process that I enjoy the most. I mean, I like the, um, I certainly like the end result, but I love tools and I love figuring things out, um, the problem solving, um, to have an idea and then figure out how can I make that into something. That's the part that gets me excited. And then to end up with something beautiful after I've experimented and made it, you know, that it actually turns out that's, really fun. I got a nice little dangle in there. Okay, so the next step now is to take these and um, dip them in liver of sulfur to give them a patina, which they, they could be done at this point. You put them on a chain, and but I kind of like doing the patina because it brings out the texture a little more. So this is liver of sulfur. Um, normally I'd have this going all day, but it stinks like eggs, rotten eggs, so I spared you that till the end here. I just put it in warm water, which works better than cold. And then I drop my pieces in there. You can take, you can, depending on what color you want, you can take them out right away and you get kind of a blue, which I like. Because I don't like though. The longer it's in, the darker it gets. I think my work is very organic. And then you rinse them in water. I describe my work as I, I like simple lines, clean lines, textures. Just dry them off a little bit. And then I'm going to buff them a little to get, bring back some of the highlights of the metal. Um, it's kind of jewelry, 
that you could wear every day of the week, or it can be fancy enough to wear dressed up in a little black dress, I think. Just depends on your style. I just, I'm really lucky to get to do what I do. I really feel fortunate to be able to do this. I feel like it's my passion. And not everybody gets to do that. <laughs> And if I buff it too much, or take too much color off, I can just put it back in the liver of sulfur and start over. I, I'll do commission work. I sell online on Etsy, and then I have about 14 stores I sell to either consignment or wholesale. It's kind of coll a, a collaboration a lot of times. People will bring me a stone that they've picked up somewhere that means something to them, you know, a trip they went on or their granddaughter gave it to them or something, and then they want it made into a piece of jewelry, so that's kind of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show, and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.